Section 26 of The Fable of the Bees by Bernard Mandeville. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. An Essay on Charity and Charity Schools, Part 2. Human nature is everywhere the same. Genius, wit, and natural parts are always sharpened by application, and may be as much improved in the practice of the meanest villainy as they can in the exercise of industry or the most heroic virtue. There is no station of life where pride, emulation, and the love of glory may not be displayed. A young pickpocket that makes a jest of his angry prosecutor and dexterously wheedles the old justice into an opinion of his innocence is envied by his equals and admired by all the fraternity. Rogues have the same passions to gratify as other men and value themselves on their honor and faithfulness to one another, their courage, intrepidity, and other manly virtues, as well as people of better professions. And in daring enterprises, the resolution of a robber may be as much supported by his pride as that of an honest soldier who fights for his country. The evils then we complain of are owing to quite other causes than what we assign for them. Men must be very wavering in their sentiments, if not inconsistent with themselves, that at one time will uphold knowledge and learning to be the most proper means to promote religion, and defend at another that ignorance is the mother of devotion. But if the reasons alleged for this general education are not the true ones, whence comes it that the whole kingdom, both great and small, are so unanimously fond of it? There is no miraculous conversion to be perceived among us, no universal bent to goodness and morality that has on a sudden overspread the island. There is as much wickedness as ever. Charity is as cold and real virtue as scarce. The year 1720 has been as prolific in deep villainy and remarkable for selfish crimes and premeditated mischief as can be picked out of any century whatever. Not committed by poor ignorant rogues that could neither read nor write, but the better sort of people as to wealth and education, that most of them were great masters in arithmetic, and lived in reputation and splendor. To say that when a thing is once in vogue, the multitude follows the common cry, that charity schools are in fashion in the same manner as hooped petticoats by caprice, and that no more reason can be given for the one than the other, I am afraid will not be satisfactory to the curious and at the same time I doubt much whether it will be thought of great weight by many of my readers what I can advance besides. The real source of this present folly is certainly very abstruse and remote from sight, but he that affords the least light in matters of great obscurity does a kind of office to inquirers. I am willing to allow that in the beginning the first design of those schools was good and charitable, but to know what increases them so extravagantly, and who are the chief promoters of them now, we must make our search another way, and address ourselves to the rigid party men that are zealous for their cause, either episcopy or presbytery, but as the latter are but the poor mimics of the first, though equally pernicious, we shall confine ourselves to the national church, and take a turn through a parish that is not blessed yet with a charity school. But here I think myself obliged in conscience to ask pardon of my reader for the tiresome dance I am going to lead him, if he intends to follow me, and therefore I desire that he would either throw away the book and leave me, or else arm himself with the patience of Job, to endure all the impertinences of low life, the cant and tittle-tattle he is like to meet with before he can go half a street's length. First we must look out among the young shopkeepers, that have not half the business they could wish for, and consequently time to spare. If such a new beginner has but a little pride more than is ordinary, and loves to be meddling, he is soon mortified in the vestry, where men of substance and long standing, or else your pert litigious or opinionated ballers, that have obtained the title of notable men, commonly bear the sway. His stock and perhaps credit are but inconsiderable, and yet he finds within himself a strong inclination to govern. A man thus qualified thinks it a thousand pities there is no charity school in the parish. He communicates his thoughts to two or three of his acquaintances first, 
they do the same to others, and in a month's time there is nothing else talked of in the parish. Everybody invents discourses and arguments to the purpose, according to his abilities. It is an errant shame, says one, to see so many poor that are not able to educate their children, and no provision made for them, where we have so many rich people. What do you talk of rich, answers another, they are the worst. They must have so many servants, coaches, and horses. They can lay out hundreds, and some of them thousands of pounds for jewels and furniture, but not spare a shilling to a poor creature that wants it. When modes and fashions are discoursed of, they can hearken with great attention, but are willfully deaf to the cries of the poor. Indeed, neighbor, replies the first, you are very right. I do not believe there is a worse parish in England for charity than ours. It is such as you and I that would do good if it was in our power, but of those that are able there is very few that are willing. Others more violent fall upon particular persons, and fasten slander on every man of substance they dislike, and a thousand idle stories in behalf of charity are raised and handed out to defame their betters. While this is doing throughout the neighborhood, he that first broached the pious thought rejoices to hear so many come into it, and places no small merit in being the first cause of so much talk and bustle. But neither himself nor his intimates, being considerable enough to set such a thing on foot, somebody must be found out who has greater interest. He is to be addressed to, and showed the necessity, the goodness, the usefulness, and Christianity of such a design. Next he is to be flattered. Indeed, sir, if you would espouse it, Nobody has a greater influence over the best of the parish than yourself. One word of you, I am sure, would engage such a one. If once you would take it to heart, sir, I would look upon the thing as done, sir. If by this kind of rhetoric they can draw in some old fool or conceited busybody that is rich, or at least reputed to be such, the thing begins to be feasible, and is discoursed of among the better sort. The parson or his curate and the lecturer are everywhere extolling the pious project. The first promoters, meanwhile, are indefatigable. If they were guilty of any open vice, they either sacrifice it to the love of reputation, or at least grow more cautious and learn to play the hypocrite, well knowing that to be flatigious or noted for enormities is inconsistent with the zeal which they pretend to, for works of supererogation and excessive piety. The number of these diminutive patriots increasing, they form themselves into a society, and appoint stated meetings, where every one concealing his vices has liberty to display his talents. Religion is the theme, or else the misery of the times occasioned by atheism and profaneness. Men of worth, who live in splendor, and thriving people that have a great deal of business of their own, are seldom seen among them. Men of sense and education likewise, if they have nothing to do, generally look out for better diversion. All those who have a higher aim shall have their attendance easily excused, but contribute they must, or else lead a weary life in the parish. Two sorts of people come in voluntarily, stanch churchmen, who have good reasons for it in petto, and your sly sinners that look upon it as meritorious, and hope that it will expiate their guilt, and Satan be non-suited by it at a small expense. Some come into it to save their credit, others to retrieve it, according as they have either lost or are afraid of losing it. Others again do it prudentially, to increase their trade and get acquaintance, and many would own to you, if they dared to be sincere and speak the truth, that they would never have been concerned in it, but to be better known in the parish." Men of sense that see the folly of it, and have nobody to fear, are persuaded into it not to be thought singular, or to run counter to all the world. Even those who are resolute at first in denying it, it is ten to one, but at last they are teased and importuned into a compliance. The charge being calculated for most of the inhabitants, the insignificancy of it is another argument that prevails much, and many are drawn in to be contributors who, without that, would have stood out and strenuously opposed the whole scheme. The governors are made of the middling people, and many inferior to that class are made use of, if the forwardness of their zeal can but overbalance the meanness of their condition. 
if you should ask these worthy rulers why they take upon them so much trouble to the detriment of their own affairs and loss of time either singly or the whole body of them they would all unanimously answer that it is the regard they have for religion and the church and the pleasure they take in contributing to the good and eternal welfare of so many poor innocents that in all probability would run into perdition in these wicked times of scoffers and free thinkers they have no thought of interest even those who deal in and provide these children with what they want have not the least design of getting by what they sell for their use and though in everything else their avarice and greediness after lucre be glaringly conspicuous in this affair they are wholly divested from selfishness and have no worldly ends one motive above all which is none of the least with the most of them is to be carefully concealed i mean the satisfaction there is in ordering and directing there is a melodious sound to the word governor that is charming to mean people everybody admires sway and superiority even imperium in belluas has its delights there is a pleasure in ruling over anything and it is this chiefly that supports human nature in the tedious slavery of schoolmasters but if there be the least satisfaction in governing the children it must be ravishing to govern the schoolmaster himself what fine things are said and perhaps wrote to a governor when a schoolmaster is to be chosen how the praises tickle and how pleasant it is not to find out the fulsomeness of the flattery the stiffness of the expressions or the pedantry of the style those who can examine nature will always find that what these people most pretend to is the least and what they utterly deny their greatest motive no habit or quality is more easily acquired than hypocrisy nor anything sooner learned than to deny the sentiments of our hearts and the principle we act from but the seeds of every passion are innate to us and nobody comes into the world without them if we will mind the pastimes and recreations of young children we shall observe nothing more general in them than that all who are suffered to do it take delight in playing with kittens and little puppy dogs what makes them always lugging and pulling the poor creatures about the house proceeds from nothing else but that they can do with them what they please and put them into what posture and shape they list and the pleasure they receive from this is originally owing to the love of dominion and that usurping temper all mankind are born with when this great work is brought to bear and actually accomplished joy and serenity seem to overspread the face of every inhabitant which likewise to account for i must make a short digression there are everywhere slovenly sorry fellows that are used to be seen always ragged and dirty these people we look upon as miserable creatures in general and unless they are very remarkable we take little notice of them and yet among these are handsome and well-shaped men as well as among their betters but if one of these turns soldier what a vast alteration is there observed in him for the better as soon as he is put in his red coat and we see him look smart with his grenadier's cap and a great ammunition sword all who knew him before are struck with other ideas of his qualities and the judgment which both men and women form of him in their minds is very different from what it was there is something analogous to this in the sight of charity children there is a natural beauty and uniformity which most people delight in it is diverting to the eye to see children well matched either boys or girls march two and two in good order and to have them all whole and tight in the same clothes and trimming must add to the comeliness of the sight and what makes it still more generally entertaining is the imaginary share which even servants and the meanest in the parish have in it to whom it costs nothing our parish church our charity children in all this there is a shadow of property that tickles everybody that has a right to make use of the words but more especially those who actually contribute and had a great hand in advancing the pious work it is hardly conceivable that men should so little know their own hearts and be so ignorant of their inward condition as to mistake frailty passion and enthusiasm for goodness virtue and charity yet nothing is more true than that the satisfaction the joy and transports they feel on the accounts i named 
pass with these miserable judges for principles of piety and religion whoever will consider of what i have said for two or three pages and suffer his imagination to rove a little further on what he has heard and seen concerning this subject will be furnished with sufficient reasons abstract from the love of god and true christianity why charity schools are in such uncommon vogue and so unanimously approved of and admired among all sorts and conditions of people it is a theme which everybody can talk of and understands thoroughly there is not a more inexhaustible fund for tittle-tattle and a variety of low conversation in hoy-boats and stage-coaches if a governor that in behalf of the school or the sermon exerted himself more than ordinary happens to be in company how he is commended by the women and his zeal and charitable disposition extolled to the skies upon my word sir says an old lady we are all very much obliged to you i do not think any of the other governors could have made interest enough to procure us a bishop it was on your account i am told that his lordship came though he was not very well to which the other replies very gravely that it is his duty but that he values no trouble nor fatigue so he can be but serviceable to the children poor lambs indeed says he i was resolved to get a pair of lawn sleeves though i read all night for it and i am very glad i was not disappointed sometimes the school itself is discoursed of and of whom in all the parish it is most expected he should build one the old room where it is now kept is ready to drop down such a one had a vast estate left him by his uncle and a great deal of money besides a thousand pounds would be nothing in his pocket at others the great crowds are talked of that are seen at some churches and the considerable sums that are gathered from whence by an easy transition they go over to the abilities the different talents and orthodoxy of clergymen dr blank is a man of great parts and learning and i believe he is very hardy for the church but i do not like him for a charity sermon there is no better man in the world than blank he forces the money out of their pockets when he preached last for our children i am sure there was abundance of people that gave more than they intended when they came to church i could see it in their faces and rejoiced at it heartily another charm that renders charity schools so bewitching to the multitude is the general opinion established among them that they are not only actually beneficial to society as to temporal happiness but likewise that christianity enjoys and requires of us we should erect them for our future welfare they are earnestly and fervently recommended by the whole body of the clergy and have more labor and eloquence laid out upon them than any other christian duty not by young persons or poor scholars of little credit but the most learned of our prelates and the most eminent for orthodoxy even those who do not often fatigue themselves on any other occasion as to religion there is no doubt but they know what is chiefly required of us and consequently the most necessary to salvation and as to the world who should understand the interest of the kingdom better than the wisdom of the nation of which the lord's spiritual are so considerable a branch the consequence of this sanction is first that those who with their purses or power are instrumental to the increase or maintenance of these schools are tempted to place a greater merit in what they do than otherwise they could suppose it deserved secondly that all the rest who either cannot or will not anywise contribute toward them have still a very good reason why they should speak well of them for though it be difficult in things that interfere with our passions to act well it is always in our power to wish well because it is performed with little cost there is hardly a person so wicked among the superstitious vulgar but in the liking he has for charity schools he imagines to see a glimmering hope that it will make an atonement for his sins from the same principle as the most vicious comfort themselves with the love and veneration they bear to the church and the greatest profligates find an opportunity in it to show the rectitude of their inclinations at no expense but if all these were not inducements sufficient to make men stand up in defence of the idol i speak of there is another that will infallibly bribe most people to be advocates for it we all naturally love triumph and whoever engages in this course is sure of conquest at least in nine companies out of ten let him dispute with whom he will considering the speciousness of the pretense and the majority he has on his side it is a castle 
an impregnable fortress he can never be beat out of, and was the most sober, virtuous man alive to produce all the arguments to prove the detriment charity schools, at least the multiplicity of them, do to society, which I shall give hereafter, and such as are yet stronger, against the greatest scoundrel in the world, who should only make use of the common cant of charity and religion. The vogue would be against the first, and himself lose his cause in the opinion of the vulgar. The rise, then, and original of all the bustle and clamor that is made throughout the kingdom on behalf of charity schools, is chiefly built on frailty and human passion. At least it is more than possible that a nation should have the same fondness, and feel the same zeal for them as are shown in ours, and yet not be prompted to it by any principle of virtue or religion. Encouraged by this consideration, I shall, with the greater liberty, attack this vulgar error, and endeavor to make it evident that far from being beneficial, this forced education is pernicious to the public, the welfare whereof, as it demands of us a regard superior to all other laws and considerations, so it shall be the only apology I intend to make for differing from the present sentiments of the learned and reverend body of our divines, and venturing plainly to deny what I have just now owned to be openly asserted by most of our bishops as well as inferior clergy. As our church pretends to no infallibility even in spirituals, her proper province, so it cannot be an affront to her to imagine that she may err in temporals, which are not so much under her immediate care. But to my task. The whole earth being cursed, and no bread to be had but what we eat in the sweat of our brows, vast toil must be undergone before man can provide himself with necessaries for his sustenance, and the bare support of his corrupt and defective nature, as he is a single creature, but infinitely more to make life comfortable in a civil society, where men are become taught animals, and great numbers of them have, by mutual compact, framed themselves into a body politic. And the more man's knowledge increases in this state, the greater will be the variety of labor required to make him easy. It is impossible that a society can long subsist, and suffer many of its members to live in idleness, and enjoy all the ease and pleasure they can invent, without having, at the same time, great multitudes of people that to make good this defect will condescend to be quite the reverse, and by use and patience inure their bodies to work for others and themselves besides. The plenty and cheapness of provisions depends, in a great measure, on the price and value that is set upon this labor, and consequently the welfare of all societies, even before they are tainted with foreign luxury, requires that it should be performed by such of their members in the first place, are sturdy and robust, and never used to ease or idleness, and, in the second, soon contented as to the necessaries of life, such as are glad to take up with the coarsest manufacture in everything they wear, and in their diet have no other aim than to feed their bodies when their stomachs prompt them to eat, and, with little regard to taste or relish, refuse no wholesome nourishment that can be swallowed when men are hungry, or ask anything for their thirst but to quench it. As the greatest part of the drudgery is to be done by daylight, so it is by this only that they actually measure the time of the labor without any thought of the hours they are employed, or the weariness they feel. And the hireling in the country must get up in the morning, not because he has rested enough, but because the sun is going to rise. This last article alone would be an intolerable hardship to grown people under thirty, who, during nonage, had been used to lie abed as long as they could sleep, but all three together make up such a condition of life as man more mildly educated would hardly choose, though it should deliver him from a jail or a shrew. If such people there must be, as no great nation can be happy without vast numbers of them, would not a wise legislature cultivate the breed of them with all imaginable care, and provide against their scarcity as he would prevent the scarcity of provision itself. No man would be poor and fatigue himself for a livelihood, if he could help it. The absolute necessity all stand in for victuals and drink, and in cold climates for clothes and lodging, makes them submit to anything that can be bore with. If nobody did want, 
nobody would work, but the great hardships are looked upon as solid pleasures when they keep a man from starving. From what has been said, it is manifest that in a free nation where slaves are not allowed of, the surest wealth consists in a multitude of laborious poor, for beside that they are the never-failing nursery of fleets and armies. Without them there could be no enjoyment, and no product of any country could be valuable. To make the society happy, and people easy under the meanest circumstances, it is requisite that great numbers of them should be ignorant as well as poor. Knowledge both enlarges and multiplies our desires, and the fewer things a man wishes for, the more easily his necessities may be supplied. The welfare and felicity of every state and kingdom require that knowledge of the working poor should be confined within the verge of their occupations, and never extend, as to things visible, beyond what relates to their calling. The more a shepherd, a plowman, or any other peasant knows of the world, and the things that are foreign to his labor or employment, the less fit he will be to go through the fatigues and hardships of it with cheerfulness and content. Reading, writing, and arithmetic are very necessary to those whose business requires such qualifications, but where people's livelihood has no dependence on these arts, they are very pernicious to the poor, who are forced to get their daily bread by their daily labor. Few children make any progress at school, but, at the same time, they are capable of being employed in some business or other, so that every hour those of poor people spend at their book is so much time lost to the society. Going to school, in comparison to working, is idleness, and the longer boys continue in this easy sort of life, the more unfit they will be when grown up for downright labor, both as to strength and inclination. Men who are to remain and end their days in a laborious, tiresome, and painful station of life, the sooner they are put upon it at first, the more patiently they will submit to it for ever after. Hard labor and the coarsest diet are a proper punishment to several kinds of malefactors, but to impose either on those who have not been used and brought up to both is the greatest cruelty, when there is no crime you can charge them with. Reading and writing are not attained to without some labor of the brain and assiduity, and before people are tolerably versed in either, they esteem themselves infinitely above those who are wholly ignorant of them, often with so little justice and moderation as if they were of another species. As all mortals have naturally an aversion to trouble and painstaking, so we are all fond of and apt to overvalue those qualifications we have purchased at the expense of our ease and quiet for years together. Those who spend a great part of their youth in learning to read, write, and cipher expect, and not unjustly, to be employed where those qualifications may be of use to them. The generality of them will look upon downright labor with the utmost contempt. I mean labor performed in the service of others in the lowest station of life, and for the meanest consideration. A man who has had some education may follow husbandry by choice, and be diligent at the dirtiest and most laborious work. But then the concern must be his own, and avarice, the care of a family, or some other pressing motive, must put him upon it. But he will not make a good hireling, and serve a farmer for a pitiful reward. At least he is not so fit for it as a day laborer that has always been employed about the plough and dung cart, and remembers not that ever he has lived otherwise. When obsequiousness and mean services are required, we shall always observe that they are never so cheerfully nor so heartily performed as from inferiors to superiors. I mean inferiors not only in riches and quality, but likewise in knowledge and understanding. A servant can have no unfeigned respect for his master, as soon as he has sense enough to find out that he serves a fool. When we are to learn or obey, we shall experience in ourselves that the greater opinion we have of the wisdom and capacity of those that are either to teach or command us, the greater deference we pay to their laws and instructions. No creatures submit contentedly to their equals, and should a horse know as much as a man, I should not desire to be his rider. End of section 26